Good day, students. Welcome to math.serve.com, where we don't just solve, we teach. In this clip, we're going to be going over problems 21 to 24 of the January 2016 Algebra 1 Common Core uh, New York Regents exam. The goal here is to go over some tips and tricks that will help you to be successful in your upcoming exam. If you have any questions, feel free to ask your question in the comment section below, and we'll be glad to address it at our earliest convenience. All right, let's take a look at question number 21. It says, which pair of equations could not be used to solve the following equations for x and y? So all we have here, well, this initial system is an unsimplified system, and all these options here are unsimplified systems of equations. So whichever one is exactly equal to this in a simplified form, that will yield the same solution, okay? So the goal here is just to reduce all the equations and to see which one is different from the others, including the provided problem. So let's start out with um, the, the given system. We're going to be reducing by dividing by the GCF, okay? So for equation number one, the GCF of four, two, and 22 is two, so we just divide this by two. And then for the second equation, the GCF for two, for negative 2, 2 and negative 8 is negative 2, so divide by negative 2. So what does that give us? This system can be reduced to, if you divide the first equation by 2, you have 2x plus y equals 11. Divide the second equation by negative 2, you have x minus y equals 4. So one thing you want to note is that anytime you divide by negative, the signs invert. Okay, so that's what happened with the second equation. Now the question is, which of these systems upon reduction or simplification results in this system right here? Okay, those ones are good. The one that does not yield this system in its reduced form, that is the answer. Okay, so let's start with um, number one. So number one, let's see. I can divide the first system by the GCF, which is 2, so divide that by 2. And then the second equation, I can divide by 2 also. If I do that, we're going to have um, 2x plus y equals 11. Okay? And then if I divide the second equation by 2, I'll have x minus y equals 4. So is this the same as what we have here? It's an exact match, so uh, option one is good. Now let's move on to option uh, three. So we can divide the first equation by the GCF. The GCF of 12, 6, and 66 is 6. 6 divides evenly into every term. And the second equation, 6, negative 6, and 24, we can divide by 6. That's the GCF. And we carry out that. Um, reduction will end up with 2x plus y equals 11 for the first one. The second one is going to be x minus y equals 4 when you divide everything by 6. Now, does this match with the original system in simplified form? It certainly does. So option 3 is good. Now let's look at option 2. Divide by 2 that's the GCF for the first equation. The second equation divided by negative 4, that's the GCF. If we carry out that simplification, we end up with 2x plus y equals 11 for the first equation. The second equation will be x minus y equals 4. Does this match this system here? It certainly does. So it looks like our answer is going to be option 4. But well, let's simplify it and see if that's the case, okay? So the GCF of the first equation is 4. 4 goes into every single term. The GCF of the second equation is negative 8. All right, when we divide by those GCFs to get a simplified form of the, these equations, we'll end up with 2x plus y equals 11. And the second one is going to be x minus y equals positive 1. So does this equation match the original system? The first one does, but the second one doesn't. So we have a system where we're looking at both equations together. So since we do not have an exact match, this one will not 
um, cannot be used to solve for the same uh, system as a given equation. Answer for number 21 is option number four. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at question number 22. It says the graph representing a function is shown below. So we have this graph right here. And it says which function has a minimum that is less than the one shown in the graph? Okay, so one thing you want to uh, note is that the k in the vertex form, the vertex form of uh, quadratics and absolute value functions as we have here, absolute value functions Uh, represent the max or mean value, the mean or max value depending on the orientation of your curve, okay, if it's opening up or down. All right, so uh, we're looking for which has a minimum that is less than this function right here. So let's figure out what the minimum is. We just look for the vertex, that's the vertex, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the coordinates here are three and negative seven. So this one has a y minimum, which is of course the k value of negative seven. So which of these has, in vertex form, will have a k value that is smaller than negative seven? That's what we're going to do. Okay, let's start from option number one. We have y equals x squared minus 6x plus 7. So I want to find, put this in vertex form so I can extract the k value and compare it with negative 7. We're going to do this by completing the square. Okay, so we have y equals x squared minus 6x. We have an incomplete square. So now focusing on the incomplete square, x squared minus 6x, we're going to add a term that makes it a perfect square trinomial. And since we're adding a term to this side of the equation, we have to subtract that term from the same side of the equation, so the equation remains unchanged, okay? So let's see, uh, to complete the square here, we're going to divide, we're gonna add b over two square to um, this two spots right here to complete the square, okay? In this problem, b is negative 6, so we divide that by 2. And then when you square it, you get positive 9. So let's insert that value here to make this a perfect square trinomial and subtract it here to uh, cause the problem to remain unchanged. So in um, vertex form, we have y equals x minus 3 quantity squared. You read the x squared and the 9, and you bring down the negative, okay? And then what is plus 9 minus, I mean, plus 7 minus 9, that's negative 2. So here, in this uh, situation, the vertex is, what is the vertex? The vertex is positive 3 and negative 2, and your y min is the k value, which is negative 2. Okay, but how does negative 2 compare with negative 7? Negative 2 is greater than negative 7. So option 1 is not what we're looking for. Okay, let's go back to uh, option 2. Let's see, option 2, we have a absolute value function that is already in its vertex form. So we have x plus 3 minus 9, absolute value of x plus 3 minus, is it nine or six? Minus six. Okay, so let's look at this one right here. We can easily discern what the vertex is. HK is the vertex. So you have, this is your H value, this is your K value. So your vertex is, remember you take the opposite of this, minus three is your H, and your K, you just take the other number on the outside, negative six. So the k value, remember, that's your minimum, okay? So your y min, in this case, which is your k value, is negative 6. 
okay, the y coordinate of your vertex. Now, how does this compare with negative 7? Negative 6 is bigger than negative 7 again. Guess what? Option 2 is not what we're looking for. We're looking for a y min that is less than negative 7. Okay, so let's advance to option 3. Option 3, we have a quadratic in standard form. So we have to complete the square with that one. x squared minus 2x minus 10. x squared minus 2x minus 10. All right, so the same algorithm that we use in number one, we're going to apply it here again. So we have y times x squared minus 2x minus 10. Now we have this incomplete square that we have to complete. So to do that, we have to add a term that makes this a perfect square trinomial. Okay, so whatever we add here, we have to subtract from here so that those two numbers cancel each other out and we're not changing the function. So what number completes the square? We're going to add b over 2 squared. We're going to insert that value into the empty spots. b in this problem is negative 2. So we divide that by 2, negative 1 squared was negative 1 squared, 1. Okay, so that's b over 2 squared. So you add a 1 here and you subtract a 1 from there. The vertex form of this quadratic function is x minus 1 square minus 11. Okay, remember you just read the x square and the c and bring down the middle sign. Now in vertex form, we can easily ascertain that the vertex is, take the opposite of this, that's h and k is negative 11. So that means that the y mean which is k, the k value is negative 11, and guess what? Negative 11 is less than negative 7, the minimum of the graph that's provided. So this is the answer we are looking for. This is a function that has a minimum value that is less than, remember, or is less than the one shown in the graph. Answer is option number 3. All right, let's take a look at number 23. It says, Grisham is considering the three situations below. One, for the first 28 days, the sunflower grows at a rate of 3.5 centimeters per day. Two, the value of a car depreciates at a rate of 15% per year after it is purchased. Three, the amount of bacteria in a culture triples every two days during an experiment. The question is, which of the statement describes a situation with an equal difference over an equal interval? So when um, you see the word equal difference, what is involved here is that you're adding a constant amount every single time. Okay, so you're adding a constant adding a constant. So when you add the constant value every single time over an interval, then um, the growth scenario or the depreciation or decay scenario will be constant. Okay, so since we're looking at difference, it's an additive relationship. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, express each of these scenarios in a recursive function format and see which one involves adding a constant in the generation of subsequent terms of our recursive function, okay? So let's start with option one. Option one, uh, it grows at a rate of 3.5 centimeters per day. So grow at this rate, 3.5 centimeters, just simply means that every single day you add 3.5 centimeters, okay? So f, sub f of n is going to be your uh, initial amount, so using recursive definition, we can call it a n minus 1, and then you add 3.5. The next day, what do you do? You add 3.5, all right? Let's take a look at the second one. You have a depreciation of 15% every year, so what's going to happen here is you're going to have f of n is going to be the previous amount, so it's the previous amount is uh, a sub n minus 1. And then to depreciate by 15%, you just take 1 minus 
the growth rate in percent format, which is uh, 0.15. Okay, 0.15. And uh, that's basically the functional form representing a depreciation of 15% uh, every single year. And if you expand this, you basically have the initial amount minus 0.15 times uh, the initial amount, an minus one, okay? All right, now let's look at the last one, the third one, f of n is going to be, it triples, okay? So you triple the previous amount. So can we express this as, um, as in percentage format or as a growth multiple of the original amount? We can just express this as the initial amount a n minus one plus two a n minus one. Okay, so it just shows you the growth rate in terms of the previous term. Now, remember the condition we talked about earlier. The condition was that we're going to be adding a constant. Whatever we're adding should be independent of the terms that uh, the subsequent terms. So if you look at the three scenarios that we have. In the first option, you add 3.5 every time. In this second option, you add 0.15 times the previous term, which changes. And then in option three, you add double the previous term. So which of them involves adding a constant? This is a variable, this is a variable, this is a constant. Our answer is option number one. So option one is our correct answer here. All right, let's take a look at 24. It says, after performing analysis on a set of data, Jackie examined the scatter plot of the residual values for each analysis. Which scatter plot indicates the best linear fit for the data? So the word you wanna zoom in on in this, uh, this representation is linear fit, okay? What does the word linear mean? Linear basically means a straight line, okay? So what we're going to do here is basically follow the trend of the points and try to capture it with some kind of curve or line and see which representation of the pattern of the points um, looks more like a straight line, okay? So if we take a look at uh, option one, you just have something like this. It kind of looks like a quadratic function. It's not like a straight line. If you look at option two, what do we have here? goes up and then down and then up, okay? Kind of looks like a, sh a shifted cubic function. And then option three, now if you look at the cluster of points here, it looks like it's clustering around, the trend is going in a straight line, okay? And then option four, of course, you have something like this. It's like a, uh, a downward facing quadratic uh, model. So which one looks like a straight line? Option number three is your correct answer for um, this problem. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. We really appreciate it. If you found the contents of this tutorial beneficial to you, do give us a thumbs up. Your positive feedback is really valuable to us. Don't forget to subscribe for updates to the remainder of this review series. If you have any questions about this uh, presentation or any math concept on the Algebra 1 Common Core Regions exam, in general, um, just place your questions in the comment section below and I'll be glad to assist you so you can be successful in your upcoming exam. More clips can be found on mycodeserve.com under test prep. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.